we can do a little better than that. Happy Sabbath. All right, sounds great. I was told there's no announcements today, so I'll be telling you that much. And uh, we're going to move to uh, our call of worship at this time. The first song will be Lift Your Name on High. Uh, if you can sing, please join us. came to save Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. I have the children's story today. So if you're a kid, raise your hand so I can see you. Oh, we have kids of all ages today. Awesome. So I want to tell you a story. Well, actually, it's not really a story so much. I just want to tell you about my dog. Does anyone remember? Have you ever heard me say what my dog's name is? Does anyone know what my dog's name is? Yell it out if you know. Fluffy is not correct. Zoe is correct. Okay, so my dog Zoe, who is also Fluffy, but that's just not her name. So I just want to tell you something she does that's so awesome. Not really. It's not awesome. Her favorite thing to do is wait until, like, at the end of the day, when I'm done working, sometimes I work from home these days during these pandemic times. But at the end of the day, I like to sit in my favorite chair with like a blanket and maybe read a nice book. Maybe I'll have supper from my chair because, you know, who cares? I can do that. And I just, I just want to relax. I'm just done. I don't want to do anything else, and I certainly don't want to get up. And she'll wait till I'm all perfectly relaxed, and then she'll look at me, and she'll just be like, mm. and I'll be like, what? What do you want? And she'll just look at me really intently, and I'll be like, what do you want? And she'll just look at me, and then I have to play the guessing game of what does my dog want? Because she won't stop until I give her what she wants. But you know what? She doesn't use her words. I just want her to use her words, so I have to guess, does she need to go outside? And so I'll get up, and I'll put my shoes on, and it's cold now, so I put a jacket on. I put her harness on, which is a little complicated. Sometimes it gets tangled. And I put her leash on, and we go outside, 
and she just takes her time picking a spot and maybe she doesn't actually have to go to the bathroom so then it's just a big waste of time and I don't figure that out for a long time so I go back inside and I get all comfortable again and all cozy and I feel her eyes just staring at me I'll say, what do you want? Use your words, Zoe. Use your words. I can't help you if you don't tell me what you need. And so then I have to get up, and I think, well, maybe she wants a treat. Well, she always wants a treat. So I think, all right, I figured it out. She just wanted a treat. And I'll sit back down, and I'll get comfortable, and I'll feel her eyes staring at me, and she makes me get up a hundred times trying to figure out what it is that she wants. And sometimes, after all these different tries of all these different things, I finally figure out that all she wants is to sit in my lap. And I think, well, Zoe, just use your legs and jump up here instead of just staring at me and making me pick you up and put you on my lap. Sometimes I just wish that we spoke the same language. You know, sometimes it's hard to communicate. And I know humans and dogs don't speak the same language. There's a, there's a barrier right there. But sometimes it's hard to communicate with each other, right? Sometimes we have big emotions and big feelings and we might need something or want something or need to express it and we don't know how to express what we need or how we feel in the right ways to our siblings or to our friends or to our parents. And sometimes it can be really difficult to figure out how to communicate with each other. And sometimes don't you wish that people knew what you were thinking don't you wish that people knew what you were feeling? Wouldn't that make it easier sometimes? You know, the awesome thing about Jesus, the awesome thing about God, is that he speaks the language of our heart. He knows exactly how we're feeling, even if we don't know how we're feeling. He knows exactly what we need, even if we don't know what we need. You know, Paul wrote in the book of Romans 8, 26-27, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's the Holy Spirit. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, that's a lot of big words, but I'll tell you what it means. It means that the Holy Spirit speaks the language of your heart. He knows what you need, and you don't ever have to worry about how to communicate with God because God already knows. God will never look at you the same way that I look at Zoe and say, use your words. I don't know what you're thinking. God knows exactly what you're thinking, and he knows your heart. Let's thank him for that right now. Dear Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who knows the language of our hearts. Help us to always turn to God never to be afraid to share with God exactly what we feel and exactly what we're thinking because God loves us exactly the way we are. Thank you for speaking the language of our hearts, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now time for our church offering. Our offering emphasis this morning is our church budget. I want to start by saying thank you for your continued faithfulness and generosity in giving to our budget. You have helped us keep it in line. Through the end of September, we have a small spending deficit of around $4,000, which is something we can easily make up as we cover our expenses for the remaining of this year. Again, as always, you may continue to mail in your giving to the post office box. You may drop off your giving to the church office during regular office hours. You may go online at madisoncampus.org to the giving tab and follow the instructions there for the online giving process. Or as always, you may continue to give in person here during the service. Again, thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity to our church budget. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the blessings you provide us every day. We thank you for the opportunities to serve and to be good stewards of all that you do provide. Be with us in this coming week and help us to join you in your work. It's in Jesus' name. I ask these things. Amen.
this song, sing along, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. Happy Sabbath. That was weak. 
Come on. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> that was better. Okay. I can't I can't speak with this with this on very well, so bear with me. How was your week? Was it a good week? Did it feel like a dumpster fire? How was your week? Was it kind of in the middle there? I think this this whole year has been some, some great moments, maybe at the beginning of the year, some terrible moments through most of the year, and I think a lot of us are just kind of hoping that it, that it settles down a bit. So I was thinking about um, our theme, our Thrive theme, and uh, when I was asked to do prayer, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking of an analogy. You know, when we, when we look at the surface of Thrive, we just think of everything is great, everything's fantastic, people who are thriving have it all together. And that's just a surface. To thrive, I believe, really means to, to have deep roots so that you're still growing and you're still able to continue well, even in the midst of bleakness. And it reminded me of something I saw when the Smokies, you remember when they burned a few years ago, it was pretty, it was devastating. And my husband and I went there uh, not too long after that happened, I guess, well, maybe about a year, and we just looked at the devastation and thought how, you know, this, this part of the country doesn't see this, how are they gonna recover? And as we drove up, um, there are lookouts everywhere if you've ever been to the Smokies, and so we pulled off and got out of the car and we're just looking around at all the burnt trees. I mean, they were still black, still black and burnt. And I happened to look down and at the base of these oak trees, it was just life, as if nothing had happened on the top. I mean, it wasn't just one branch or two, it was branches all around the base of these oak trees. And I was really, I was amazed. I was amazed at the life coming out of the bleakness of this fire just a year earlier. And it reminded me of this verse, and it says, it says, Isaiah 61, 3, and it's to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. And I know that's, that's part of thriving. That's what God wants to give to us this year and every year. Um, because as Adventists, we know this, this may only be the beginning of what things are going to happen uh, right before Jesus comes. So I invite you, to, if you want to kneel, you're welcome to kneel. If you want to sit, if you want to stand and pray with me, um, but please, uh, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. I want to thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, the opportunity, the freedom and the opportunity to gather here together and worship you and glorify you and know that you want us to thrive. You have given us the Holy Spirit and you've given us the tools so that we can thrive in the midst of, of any kind of uh, destruction or any kind of um, uncertainty. And we ask, Lord, that you, that you join us today and bring your spirit here, and we ask that you be with Pastor Ken as he gives us your message. And, Lord, we just pray that, that you um, continue to protect us, continue to guide us, and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. Happy Sabbath. I guess so, is that? I know it's been an interesting week, uh, particularly if you watch the news at all. And uh, this Sabbath, we're going to take semi-break from the news, all right? We're just going to sit back and enjoy Jesus for a little bit. Is that all right? All right. 
So uh, let's go ahead and start off with a poll. Wait a minute. Raise your hand if you attend church. Come on, you're sitting here. You, you better have your hand up. You are attending church right now, so you got your hand up. Okay, great. Raise your hand if you were born into a Christian family. In other words, your family attended church semi-regularly, but you're born into a Christian family. Okay? Raise your hand if you attended Christian schools, if you went to private schools that were Christian or Adventist schools. I shouldn't say and, they're both, right? All right. Raise your hand if you work for a Christian business or organization. If you work for a Christian business or organization. Okay. Finally, raise your hand if you are a member of the Madison Campus Seventh-day Adventist Church. Large percentage of you are. Excellent. Then this sermon's for you. We're talking about thriving in Jerusalem. I'm doing a four-part series on thriving in different cities. Three of them from the Bible. The one that we live in, in Nashville as well, that we've added as the final sermon in the series. Last week we started in Egypt. What does it take to thrive in Egypt? And we found out that Egypt, often thought of as the land of bondage, is also something else, right? There are two aspects to Egypt. It's also a land of refuge. God sends his people to Egypt to find refuge, including Jesus himself, who as a little baby was taken to Egypt to protect him from King Herod. The problem with Egypt is when God sends us to a place of refuge and we make that our home, instead of recognizing it's only temporary. And so we talked about how Egypt is this metaphor for how God can provide refuge to us, but it's not a place to stay. It's temporary. This week we're talking about thriving in Jerusalem. And we're going to be using Jerusalem as a metaphor for those of us who are in the church. We're Christians. We're surrounded with Christianity and Adventism. And so that's what Jerusalem will be for us this week. And we're going to talk about it in the context of our theme verse for this year, which is Jeremiah 17, verse 8, where it says, They are like trees planted along a river bank, with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green, and they never stop producing fruit. You know, the point of having your roots in the water is not to have green leaves. It's to produce fruit. When you think about that for a minute, remember Jesus had a parable with a fig tree that didn't produce figs but had beautiful leaves. And Jesus said that's not the purpose. He actually curses the tree. So the reason why we have roots going into the water is not so we look good, but so that we produce fruit for God's kingdom. But today we're talking about what it means to thrive in Jerusalem. That's a pretty good looking picture if you ask me. Anybody put the uh, decade there? 70s. How did you guess? Was it this right here, or was it the nice little bowl cut thingy that was going on there? In case you're wondering, uh, that is me right there with my family. Uh, the, uh, the lovely people getting married um, are my Uncle Dave and my Aunt Verna. And you can see my parents are standing right there. That's my mom and dad. Um, and then the rest are uncles and aunts and my grandparents that are there. And uh, this wedding... This wedding gets brought up anytime there's a big family gathering. And I'm not going to lie to you, I debated whether to use this story because I know it will be used against me. Um, but it was such a good metaphor, I had to use it. This wedding is legendary for all the wrong reasons for me. You see, during, well, not during the wedding, but at one of the wedding celebrations, 
my parents lost track of me for a moment. Not a problem. Grandparents, uncles, aunts, everybody there, everybody, you know, celebrating the wedding in the room. And then my mother smelled something. And it was a smell that is familiar to parents with children that are about that age. It wasn't a pleasant smell. It was the smell of a diaper that needed changing. No problem. We know how that works. My parents changed thousands of diapers, I'm sure. However, my mother became more horrified as she looked to see where the smell was originating and looked down and saw that there was a trail. These were the days before, you know, before it was common to have, you know, diapers that work. <laughs> um, this is back in the day when you had the cloth diapers and the, and the pins right in them, right? And to my mother's horror, through the middle of the gathering hall that we're in is a brown streak, a smelly brown streak leading to a child who was squatting, making uh, the sounds that would go along with uh, more brown stuff coming out. And my mother, as, as any of you who are parents will just, you can just feel her, ah, you know, because this is a wedding. <laughs> and this is my ch child literally pooping on your wedding. And my mother rushes over to where I'm at squatting starts to reach down to pick me up and I said no I am not done and this has become a family legend I may be 45 years old but if our family were together are you done Ken is it okay is it all right? Some of you are desperately trying to figure out what this has to do with the sermon. I'm going to leave you hanging for a little bit because I'm not done yet. <laughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem has an incredible history to it. The first place that we see it being mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14, when Melchizedek, the king of Salem, comes to bless Abraham after a military victory by Abraham and his servants. And Abraham pays a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek, a king of the Most High God, or a priest of the Most High God. And biblical scholars believe this is the first mention of Jerusalem in the Bible, that Melchizedek was actually the king of Jerusalem. The next time we find uh, uh, Jerusalem in the Bible is in Joshua chapter 10. And we find that the king of Jerusalem goes out to battle the Gibeonites, Joshua comes to the aid of the Gibeonites. But what happens is, is that Joshua and the Israelites during the conquest of the Promised Land never, never conquer Jerusalem. They don't take it over. It's just left there. 
And so later on in the biblical story, we go through King Saul and then we come to King David. And Jerusalem doesn't belong to the Israelites. It doesn't belong to the kingdom. But David sees that city and he knows that he wants it. He wants that city to be his capital and so he goes and he besieges it. But the people in Jerusalem are very confident. Jerusalem was incredibly well fortified. It it was impregnable. You couldn't tear down the walls with the technology that they had at that time. It was hard. It was was up on a hill. It was very hard to take. And so the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem taunt David, saying, you'll never get in here, even if the blind and... Even the blind and lame could keep you out. For the Jebusites thought that they were safe. I find it interesting that the Bible says this because it's going to the point that I really want you to come away with today. They taunt David saying, you couldn't get here. Even the people who are blind and lame could defend the city from you. And David actually conquers the city. He finds a a, a waterway in, comes in, conquers the city. And then he has the last laugh. But I want you to see the real danger of Jerusalem. The real danger of Jerusalem is that people think that they're safe because they live there. Can I say that one more time for you? Remember, we're talking metaphorically. I'm asking you to think metaphorically. But the problem with Jerusalem is that people think that they're safe simply because they live there. David conquers the city. It's known as as the city of David. It's also known as the city of peace. Why? Because that last part, Salem there. If you, if you say it, when you transliterate it, it sounds like shalom in Hebrew, which means peace. So when they, when they would look at Jerusalem, the way that it sounded was a lot like the Hebrew for peace. So it was the city of peace. Today it's known as the holy city. Three major world religions consider it the center of worship, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, all claim Jerusalem as the holy city. But the problem with the holy city is that a lot of people think that they're safe because they live there. And Jesus speaks to this city of peace in Luke chapter 19. This should have been Jesus' most happy moment. Instead, it's one of only two places in the New Testament where Jesus is recorded as weeping, as crying. One is at the death, at the, at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and this is the other time. It's a triumphal journey, uh, entry into Jerusalem. When Jesus is being proclaimed to be the king of the Jews by his disciples and by the crowds, he's riding on a donkey, the symbol of a king coming to claim his city. He comes into Jerusalem. But as before he gets into the cities, he overlooks it. Instead, as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, Luke 19, starting in verse 41, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. You see what Jesus is doing there? City of peace. You're the city of peace, but you don't understand the way to peace. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Does that strike terror into anybody else's heart? It should. These are the people who were gifted 
with the Ten Commandments written by the hand of God on Mount Sinai. These are the people that had a spiritual pedigree that none of us in this room can brag about like they can. These are the people that literally had God living with them in the sanctuary. There was Solomon's temple. There was the second temple. By this time, there was King Herod's temple. Magnificent structures of worship. But Jesus says to them, your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. That should keep every single one of us in this room on our knees praying about that. Because if it could happen to them, it can happen to us. How terrible, how terrible is it to have God show up and not recognize him? It should bring us to tears. For God to show up and to not recognize him. You see, recognizing God has nothing to do with where you live. It doesn't have anything to do with following the rules. It's not about your church membership. It's not about your heritage and genealogies. These things, when that's all you have, will leave you blind and lame and thinking that you can defend a city. When in fact that city is about to be conquered. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus speaking about Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. How is it possible that the city of God, the city of peace, could be the city where God's prophets and God's messengers are stoned and killed? Is it possible that you and I today, as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, could be capable of doing the same thing? Is it possible that we could be stoning and killing God's messengers to us? Could it be possible that our ancestors did that, and we say, like these people did, oh, we wouldn't have done that, right? If we're all a little bit honest, wouldn't we admit that we think, if I had been those children in the wilderness, I wouldn't have done what they were doing. I would have been on Moses' team. I mean, if you see this, the Red Sea split in two, you got to be. I mean, they were, just, they were just a lot less intellectual than I am. If I had lived in Jerusalem, I would never have crucified Jesus. I wouldn't have been one of the people in the mob yelling, crucify him, crucify him. I wouldn't have done that. Jesus calls us out today in the same message that he calls these people out. And says, you know what, you think you're so much better than them, but you're not. You're not. You need to recognize your spiritual brokenness. You need to recognize that it's not enough to attend Madison Campus Church. This is not me telling you not to come to church, by the way. But it's not enough all by itself. It's not enough to have your membership on the books of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's not enough to attend Madison Academy or Madison Campus Elementary. Again, great places to be. But if that's what you're counting on to save you, your city will be torn apart. I long 
strong to protect you as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. Have you ever seen a hen protect her chickens, her chicks? I don't know, the resolution isn't great in here, so it's hard to see, but those, there's little chicks around that chicken, and she is telling that dog, you're going to stay away. This billy goat decides to get a little attention from those chicks. Mama hen, having none of it. None of it. Going to chase that. I watched another video that was a little bit more graphic than I wanted to, where a, a hen faced down a king cobra with her chicks. But I want you to notice something about a chick going under its mother's wings. A mother chick can run to that chick and put her wings over it, but if the chick runs away, as much as that mother chicken wants to protect it, it can't. Think about that for a minute. When you see that mother chicken, those chicks have to allow her to put her wings over them. Any one of them who wants to go squirting away can. And then they're out there with the danger. And yeah, the mother will chase them down and do what she can to get them. But in the end, it's that chick's choice. It's something in theology that we call free will. God doesn't force us to accept his protection. He doesn't force us to go underneath his wings. But I want you to hear the heart of Jesus, the ache in his heart. Any of you who are a parent and have watched your child make a decision that you knew was going to end badly for them, know the panic you feel, the hurt, the fear. And I hope you hear that in Jesus' voice. As he's speaking to Israelites, he's not gloating that Jerusalem is going to be torn down and that they're going to, he's not gloating about any of that. Rather, you hear desperation and pain. Why won't you let me take care of you? Why won't you come underneath my wings of protection? One of the people that didn't come under Jesus' wings of protection was a man named Saul. He couldn't stand what Jesus stood for. And when Jesus was crucified and came up missing afterwards, Saul began to persecute those who were left behind, persecuting the followers of this crazy Jesus. He held the coats for the people who would murder Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And holding those coats, it was a symbol of his acceptance, a symbol of his belief that that was the right thing to have happen. And then Paul met Jesus. Then Paul experienced Jesus in his fullness. And it transformed him. And he realized the truth. Found in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Paul's speaking of him. He changes his name. His, his life is so profoundly changed that Saul changes his name. His name is changed to Paul. Paul writes, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. He's setting up his bona fides. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. You should be saved then, right? He's got the genealogy. He keeps the commandments of God. He pursues what he believes is righteousness. I obeyed the law without fault. What does he say next? I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless 
because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. And by the way, that word there is more appropriate to what was in my diaper. But the New Living Translation didn't want to gross you out. Counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Thriving in Jerusalem means worshiping Jesus, not Jerusalem. Family. Jesus is the beginning. Jesus is the end. And Jesus is everything in between. If you think that your church, your education, your genealogy, it will not save you. I sometimes hear people talk about how many generations Adventists they are. And I'm always happy to have that discussion because I wished it mattered. Because I'm a seventh generation Adventist and I challenge you to beat that. Literally, one of my ancestors was a Millerite preacher. Beat that. I was dedicated by Eric B. Hare. My aunt's mother, my, my uncle had the, the wisdom to marry Aunt Sue from Your Story Hour's daughter. And so Aunt Sue sat on my bed and told me bedtime stories. If ever there was an Adventist of Adventists, I'm it. I win, you lose. But that's junk. It's worthless. Being a pastor, worthless if I don't know Jesus. Jesus is what it's all about. I want you to recognize your king when he shows up here. I want you to know Jesus. Haystacks don't save you. They're good, though. Quoting Ellen White won't save you but knowing what she's written is good you've got to know Jesus it's about a relationship with the God who created the universe and just like any other relationship that you want to work you have to spend time with him if you want to know him you do that in nature and appreciating what he's created. You do that in his word that tells you his heart for you. That's his love letter to you. You do that in prayer. Both what comes out of your heart and the silence that allows him to speak back to you in your life. Do not use church busyness to replace the relationship that you must have with Jesus. Don't be little Kenny. Jesus has the solution to your poopy diet. And you need him to change it because later on you will realize how deficient you are. Anybody else recognize that as you've gotten older in life and you look back and you see how much you needed Jesus when you didn't really think you thought you were doing just fine? 
Anybody else ever feel a little embarrassed by things that you did in the past? Family, accept Jesus today. Accept him every day. Choose him. Jesus, like my mother, wants to gather you in his arms, poopy diaper and all, and take you and fix what's problem, the problem that you have. Are you going to tell him that you're not done yet? Jesus, I can make myself a little bit better before you take care of me. I'm not finished doing what I have to do here. Or will you accept that Heavenly Father who wants to take you under his wings, take you in his arms, and enter into deep and meaningful relationship with you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, many of us in this room think we've accepted you into our hearts. Many in this room have. But Lord, I pray. I pray that we don't become arrogant. That we don't think that because of where we're at, what we've accomplished, what we've done, that that somehow means we don't need you. May we be recommitted to growing into a deeper and more meaningful relationship with you with every day that goes by. We pray that your Holy Spirit would pull the weeds out of our life that try to choke you out. We pray that you would give us the desire to connect with you richly and deeply. Help us to worship you and never worship Jerusalem. We pray in your name. Amen. May God bless you. We're so happy that you are here today, and uh, we want you to know that you can always watch our services online. Uh, we do want to encourage you to go ahead and have conversations outside in the fresh air. Um, we do need to go ahead and take down uh, the gym. Some of us will be needing to take care of that. So we just want to ask you to kind of move out of the gym so we can take care of some of those things. But God bless you if you need anything. Don't hesitate to reach out to any of your pastoral team. Have a great Sabbath.